invite you to take your Bibles this evening and turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter 49. Our scripture reading, Isaiah 49. As we think about Title Word Catechism, Lord's Day number 9, we're looking at God as Creator. Isaiah 49, this is God's Word. Let's give our attention to its reading. Listen to me, O coastlands, and give attention, you peoples, from afar. The Lord called me from the womb. From the body of my mother, he named my name. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my right is with the Lord and my recompense with my God. And now the Lord says, he who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and that Israel might be gathered to him for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord and my God has become my strength. He says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nations, the servant of rulers. Kings shall see and arise, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. Thus says the Lord, in a time of favor I have answered you, in a day of salvation I have helped you. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, to establish the land, to apportion the desolate heritages, saying to the prisoners, come out, to those who are in darkness, appear. They shall feed along the ways, on all bare heights shall be their pasture. They shall not hunger or thirst, neither scorching wind nor sun shall strike them. For he who has pity on them will lead them, and by springs of water will guide them. And I will make all my mountains a road, and my highways shall be raised up. Behold, these shall come from afar, and behold, these from the north and from the west, and these from the land of Syene. Sing for joy, O heavens, and exult. O earth, break forth, O mountains, into singing, for the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. As Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child, that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Your builders make haste, your destroyers, and those who laid you waste go out from you. Lift up your eyes around and see, they all gather, they come to you. As I live, declares the Lord, you shall put them all on as an ornament. You shall bind them on as a bride does. Surely your waste and your desolate places and your devastated land, surely now you will be too narrow for your inhabitants. And those who swallowed you up will be far away. The children of your bereavement will yet say in your, your ears, the place is too narrow for me. Make room for me to dwell in. And then you will say in your heart, who has borne me these? I was bereaved and barren, exiled and put away. But who has brought up these? Behold, I was left alone. From where have these come? Thus says the Lord God. Behold, I will lift up my hand to the nations and raise my signal to the peoples, and they shall bring your sons in their arms, and your daughters shall be carried on their shoulders. Kings shall be your foster fathers, and their queens your nursing mothers. With their faces to the ground, they shall bow down to you and lick the dust of your feet. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Those who wait for me shall not be put to shame. Can the prey be taken from the mighty, or the captives of a tyrant be rescued? For thus says the Lord, 
Even the captives of the mighty shall be taken, and the prey of the tyrant be rescued. For I will contend with those who contend with you, and I will save your children. I will make your oppressors eat their own flesh, and they shall be drunk with their own, their own blood as with wine. Then all flesh shall know that I am the Lord, your Savior, and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. The grass withers, and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let's pray. Gracious Father in heaven, I come before you this night and ask for your blessing. I ask you for your blessing that we might, having heard your word, that we would believe it. Lord, there are so many things written in this chapter that are marvelous, amazing. We have yet to see them fulfilled. And so, Lord, we know they point us forward. They point us forward to that great final day when the servant, your son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, returns in all his glory. And so help us, Lord, as we attend this chapter this night to understand <clears throat> its meaning, its message for us. That we might see you our Father is the Almighty Creator of all. We might deepen our trust in You. We might acknowledge Your power to complete everything that You have promised. So bless our study tonight, for we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, remember where we are in the Heidelberg Catechism. We're still working through the section on deliverance, redemption, Salvation, And we begin tonight with an exposition, if you will, of the Apostles' Creed. And that is, of course, what the Catechism is doing. Question by question, we'll be examining all the various phrases of the Apostles' Creed, which is helpful to us, very helpful to us. We use this creed in our morning services every week, and so it's, it, it, it's very good for us to give our attention to it. So we might recite it, not, not just sort of in a, in a rapid fashion, uh, not paying attention to the words, but paying attention to the words, but more than that, or along with that, we can say, understanding that it is rooted in Scripture. And as I love, I love this question we're looking at tonight, understanding that it means something significant for us as God's people. We think of God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And these are, these are big ideas that, that God is almighty, that God is the creator but the catechism question before us tonight focuses our attention right there in its second point upon what it means for us that we can trust Him, that we can trust Him. And in this way, then, the existence of God and the creation of all things is not a matter of academic or theological curiosity. It is to us life. He is the one who made all things. He is the one who is all-powerful and who works all things according to the counsel of His will, as we considered last Sunday night. He is the one that we can trust. And many times in the Heidelberg Catechism, there's those phrases or those sentences that capture the pastoral heart of those who put this catechism together. And this question is no different. I trust God so much that I do not doubt He will provide whatever I need for body and soul and will turn to my good whatever adversity He sends upon me in this veil of tears. We want to consider this evening our chapter with the Heidelberg Catechism in view. And I, I, I wrestled a little bit about which chapter and which passage to look at. I originally had thought that I would simply preach on Matthew chapter 6, our, our responsive reading. And, that's, uh, and, and that was my original leaning. But as I continued to search the scriptures, I, I felt that Isaiah 49 actually lays out quite well uh, God's creating all things. Um, and the trust that Isaiah speaks of, that we can have of the one who will bring all things to pass. And the one who is able. And these are our three points tonight. And so I encourage you to have your bulletin in front of you. But also your Bible as we'll be looking at this chapter. And I'll be referencing other passages in Isaiah as well. I've yet to preach through the entirety of Isaiah. It's on the schedule. It's coming in the years to come. But we're not there yet. So let me remind you. Isaiah is a prophet. Isaiah is written uh, 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 to the southern kingdom. Uh, as before they go away into exile. And God promising, not only are they going to go into exile, but that they're going to come out of exile. 
And Isaiah, if you will, focuses the attention in the beginning chapters on the nation of Israel, their failures before God as God's chosen servant. And servant is used several times in the book of Isaiah, sometimes to refer to Israel, sometimes to refer to Cyrus, sometimes as in our chapter tonight, in the, in, the, in the servant songs, as they're often called, four songs in the book of Isaiah, they point most clearly to our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so that's where we're at tonight, is in the second of the, Savior, or second of the servant songs. And we begin then with the Father who created all things. Now, of course, we can go elsewhere in Scripture to see this in Genesis chapter 1, in Hebrews chapter 11, in John chapter 1. It's all over Scripture that God is the one who made all things. And in fact, uh, the creation of all things under God uh, is something that Isaiah himself focuses upon. Now, the chapter itself focuses upon the life of the servant. But just by way of example, in Isaiah 45 in verse 18, we read this. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens... He is God who formed the earth and made it. He established it. He did not create it empty. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no other. God claims absolute sovereignty over all of creation. That he is the one who has made it. He is the one who has formed it. All of it goes together with what we know from the opening chapters of Genesis. And not just all of creation, but each and every individual now, O Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay, you are our potter, we are all the work of your hand, Isaiah 64 and verse 8. And that brings me then to the creator over life. And this is where our servant song begins. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother, he named me. Now again, this is the servant, and ultimately it's the servant that would suffer. But the reality is, is that it's, it's all of those who are God's servants. He is the one who creates. He is the one who forms. He is sovereign over all. And so here the servant sings, if you will, the words that we know that are true of us as well. That is, if God is sovereign and creator of all, then he is creator of us. Just as Israel was created by God, so also we, fashioned by our Heavenly Father in this world. Now again, this is used in other passages as well, not just in Isaiah, but in Jeremiah. We read in Jeremiah 1.5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Or the words of King David in Psalm 139, You formed me in my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Back to Isaiah, in verse 49, chapter 49 and verse 5. Now the Lord says, He who formed me from the, from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, that Israel might be gathered. There's clearly a task that's given to this servant. It's to gather the people of God, and not just the people of God in Judah and in Israel, but it goes on to talk about the people of God from all the nations. Creation has an eye, then, to new creation. And this is, again, this is a theme in in Isaiah. Sometimes when, when God points to creation, He's using it to point to the new creation, the new hope that we have. Isaiah 43, verses 18 and 19. Again, remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? It will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Or Isaiah 65, and verse 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. So we see clearly that God is the creator over all things. God is the creator over life. And this, this, presses, this presses a reality that we're going to come to in our next catechism question. Um, I wasn't going to say much about it, but then I realized that we'll actually won't get to, quite to the Lord's Day number 10 until the middle of January. And so this idea of creation and God's sovereignty over all things means that he is providentially, providentially working all things together. Now again, this is clearly in our catechism question this evening. It's clearly clearly in Scripture. God works all things together. 
the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. John Calvin puts it this way, we must be persuaded not only that as he once formed the world, so he sustains it by his boundless power, governs it by his wisdom, preserves it by his goodness, in particular rules the human race with justice and judgment, bears with them in mercy, shields them by his protection, but also that not a particle of light or wisdom or justice or power or rectitude or genuine truth will anywhere be found which does not flow from him and of which he is not the cause. In this way, we must learn to expect and ask all things from him and thankfully ascribe to him whatever we receive. In that way, I think that the authors of the Heidelberg Catechism were in line with Calvin's own thinking. These ideas, that these thoughts about, about God as the creator, as the provider, as the one who oversees all things, are not meant to be theological treatises on a shelf. No, they are to be theological treatises in our hearts and in our minds. That we might reflect upon them. That we might remind ourselves at all times that God is good. That God is sovereign. That whatsoever comes to pass, he is working together for good. Beloved, if we don't remind ourselves of these things, if we only think that the good things that come into our lives are from God and everything else, God is just out of control, then he is not the sovereign creator. And there can be no hope to be offered to us. For then we're just in a chaotic world where everything can go any which way or worse. It's all up to us. Scripture doesn't speak that way. Think about the context of Isaiah 49. Speaking there hundreds of years before the coming of Jesus Christ. Speaking before all of the things that would happen. And yet speaking absolutely directly to our greatest need. That the servant would come and that he would redeem us. For this reason, our God is the creator who is praised. Verse 7, thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and His Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nation, the servant of rulers. Kings shall see and arise, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. You see here clearly the response even of the kings of the world. What's more in verse 13, sing for joy, O heavens, and exult. O earth, break forth, O mountains, into singing. For the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. All of creation is called to witness God's faithfulness to his people. All of creation is called to witness God's goodness. And now I sing kind of odd to you. Why call upon the heavens to sing and to exalt for the earth to exalt? Well, besides the fact that we, we sang even in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork, day after day pour forth speech. But what's more, it's heaven and earth are actually witnesses in Scripture. You see, in Deuteronomy, we see heaven and earth being called to be witnesses of the covenant made with Israel. In Deuteronomy 32, that even as Moses is going to charge the Israelites to faithfulness, Heaven and earth will be witness of the covenant. But what's more, we know from Romans chapter 8 that, that, that all of creation currently groans and waits, longing for redemption. Why? Because all of creation has been subject to the curse. And so we read that creation itself one day will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Remember Jesus' words, that even the rocks would cry out. Oh, beloved, all of creation praises our Heavenly Father, praises Him for making all things, for sustaining all things. We join our voices singing with creation, praising our God who created all things, who created even our very life. What's more, Isaiah presses that God is the Father we can trust. 
We can trust Him for salvation. And this is, I think, coming just from the whole context of Isaiah 49. It is a servant song. The whole point of Isaiah's songs is the promised Redeemer will save His people from their sins. Coming to a culmination and sense in Isaiah 53, a song of the suffering servant. Oh, He would be glorious. He would bring forth the kingdom of God. And yet He would do so through suffering. We see this in Isaiah 49, beginning in verse 8, pressing and showing God's redemptive plan. Thus says the Lord, in a time of favor, I answered you. In a day of salvation, I have helped you. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people to establish the land, to portion the desolate heritages. Again, speaking to the servant and through the servant to all those who trust in the Lord. That He is our salvation. That we will trust Him and not be afraid. For the Lord God is our strength and our song. And He has become our salvation. Isaiah 12 and verse 2. We trust Him for salvation. We trust Him also to remember us. Look with me here. Really the heart of this chapter beginning in verse 14. It begins with a complaint. The Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. Now it's easy for us to dismiss this claim or to think of those Old Testament Israelites as simply being a hard-hearted people. And it's true. They were at times. But they suffered greatly. And moreover, it's probably not the foolish, unbelieving Israelites who are speaking this way. For they are the ones who had already turned their hearts away from the Lord. No, this kind of a call saying the Lord has forsaken me, my Lord has forgotten me. It is, a, it, it is the words of those who trust in God. It's the words of Psalm 13 verses 1 and 2. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? Will you hide, will you long hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel of my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Perhaps Isaiah 49 and verse 14 is not unchecked patience, but a true fear of those who trust the Lord. And if so, this is helpful for us. For there are times when we can feel this very same way, forsaken and forgotten. Matthew Henry comments, See how deplorable the case of God's people may be sometimes, such that they may seem to be forsaken and forgotten of their God. And at such a time, their temptations may be alarmingly violent. Beloved, this is a passage, along with many others, to turn to in those moments where it seems as though God is forgotten. God is forsaken. But then we read of the comfort Verse 15, can a woman forget her nursing child, that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forgot, forget, yet I will not forget you. Interestingly, God points to the reality of nature as an example. And God's compassion is expressed as a mother who loves her child. You see, a mother who loves her child, a mother cannot forget it's, it, what has in mind here, a nursing child. There are physical realities at play when a child cries for food. If a mother neglects feeding a child for too long, her body will ache. This is what Isaiah is getting at. This is what God is getting at. And just as natural as it is for a woman to not forget her nursing child, he will not forget his people. Now, again, uh, he, he presses this. Even these may forget. You see, when God speaks of himself as our father, we, we can have a tendency to wonder, well, maybe he's like my father, who maybe wasn't great, maybe wasn't loving. Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11, Jesus picks up on this and says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who receives, who asks, receives, and the one who seeks, finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which of you, he says, 
If his son asks him for bread, we'll give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a serpent. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Who ask him? It's that same idea here. Like we can all probably think of fathers in this world who, who really would not give their children the things that they need. We may even think of mothers who neglect their children. And God says, even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. God's love is perfect. And God's love is everlasting. And God does not love someone today and abandon them tomorrow. Indeed, it is pictured this way in Isaiah 49 and verse 16. Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. This might be drawing on something like Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 8. There in Deuteronomy 6, when God is speaking to them about the words that he has given them, he tells them that you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. I remember the point of that. And everything they do and everything that they think is everything they see. They are to have in view the law of God. And we know, of course, from our study of Matthew's gospel that there were ways in which, they, in which the Pharisees especially uh, took that to an extreme and made these giant phylacteries to put in front of their eyes. And that's not the point. The point of our passage here is the idea that God does not forget. It's as serious as if he had engraved you upon his hands. Now, of course, God does not have hands. And so it's anthropomorphic language that's meant to drive home the truth. And yet, and yet, there is a sense in which God has engraved us upon his hands in a real way. Matthew Henry puts it this way, some apply his engraving his church on the palms of his hands to the wounds in Christ's hands when he was crucified. He will look on the marks of them and remember those for whom he suffered and died. Now this is important. This is important for us to get. Because God does not engrave upon his mind or upon his hands general names or names in general. Surely there's a Susie out there who will trust me one day. I'll put that name there. No, there would be no hope. There would be no true hope unless God knew all those for whom he would send his son to die. And he engraves them on the palms of his hands. He remembers them forever. It says here, your walls are continually before me. Of course, speaking there in the Old Testament context, speaking of Jerusalem, the city surrounded by walls and the protection that God would give them. But no less true for us that God knows everything. As we trust him for salvation, we trust him to remember us. And remember that word remembrance. It's a covenant word. It's the word that when God remembered Noah in the middle of the flood, he brought an end to the flood and brought him off the ark. When God remembered Israel, he brought them out of Egypt. When God remembers his people, it is for the purpose of delivering them, of giving them hope and new life. All of this is grounded in God's nature. We see we trust God for salvation. We trust him in his remembrance and it's grounded in his nature look with me at verses 17 and 18 of Isaiah your builders make haste your destroyers and those who laid you waste go out from you let them your eyes around and see they all gather they come to you as I live declares the Lord you shall put them all on as an ornament you shall bind them on as a bride does there's a lot of language here that we're not going to get into this evening but Specifically there, the phrase, as I live. God's covenant, God's oath, it's grounded in who he is. <coughs> as I live is, is, is that covenantal language that promises that whatever he has said will in fact come to pass. It's that kind of language that, sure, we can use it, but it's so limited. We don't live forever. The Lord lives forever. 
The Lord is almighty. The Lord is the one who controls all things. And that brings us then to our third and final point. He is the Father who created the Father we can trust. He is the Father who is able. Think about it for a moment. If God had made all of His great promises and we trusted Him completely, but He was not all powerful, He was not all able. What hope would we have? But He is the one who is all able. In verse 22, we read, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up my hand to the nations and raise my signal to the peoples, and they shall bring your sons in their bosom, and your daughters shall be carried on their shoulders. Now this raising God's hand, again, is it's anthropomorphic language, but it's used to speak of God's strength. It's used elsewhere in Scripture and even in Isaiah to speak of God's strength in creation. My hand laid the foundation of the earth. My right hand spread out the heavens. Isaiah 48 and verse 13. It's used in the language of providence that God feeds the animals in Psalm 104. But here, more specifically, it's used in redemption. He will raise his signal, that is, a sign. And that will be the time where the sons and daughters are brought back. Now, the context of this is the return from exile. And therefore, the prophecy speaks that the nations will respond positively to God's signal of bringing many children to Zion. And this will reverse the terrible results of God's judgment that brought about the destruction and the deportation of many in Israel. Like the Exodus, though, this was a promise of redemption that the servant would work for the people of God. And so the signal to the peoples is something that God is going to make clear to all. So much so, in verse 23, kings shall be your foster fathers, and their queens your nursing mothers. With their faces to the ground, they shall bow down to you and lick the dust of your feet. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Those who wait for me shall not be put to shame. We see here clearly, first of all, the authority that our God has over the rulers of the earth. Indeed, there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God Romans 13 and verse 1. And the glorious promise here is that one day, one day, that even the kings and the queens of the earth, that is all the great ones, all the mighty ones, they will bow before the Lord. It's a promise that one day there will be no, no more persecution. All over, all those people that we pray for week after week, who face persecution, things that we can hardly even imagine, one day it will come to an end. Now that presses the question of when. Now this passage actually grounds a section in our own Westminster Confession of Faith on the duties of the civil magistrate. And it is true that the rulers of this earth ought to obey the word of the Lord and seek refuge in Christ, <coughs> even as Psalm 2 declares. And it is also true that every tyrant who persecutes the church of God only heaps coals upon his own head. Now there are glimpses of this in Scripture. In fact, Isaiah is speaking of one of those, Cyrus, the king who will bring the people of Israel out of exile. But I'm not convinced that this promise means that this side of Christ's return, that these things will come to pass in a final and full way. It points us forward. It points us to that great day when the angel will call out, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit. Revelation chapter 18. There is a day, beloved, when the kings of the earth will bow before our Redeemer. There's a day when they will bow, as Isaiah says, before us as well. And so we wait for that, for that day. Trusting not only that our God has promised it, but that he is able to bring it to pass. Thirdly, under the Father who is able, he provides protection and he brings judgment. Verses 25 and 26. 
For thus says the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken, and the prey of the tyrant be, re be rescued. For I will contend with those who contend with you, and I will save your children. I will make your oppressors eat their own flesh, and they shall be drunk with their own blood as with wine. And then all flesh shall know that I am the Lord your Savior, and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. God's contending, God's fighting for his people is important to our bearing under sufferings now. We are not to take vengeance for ourselves, for that is the Lord's to do. He will repay, as the Apostle Paul reminds us in Romans. He is able to defeat our enemies. He has given us a king who is currently conquering all of his and all of our enemies. Indeed, he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. You see, beloved, our Father is the one who has created all things. Things in heaven and on earth and under the earth. He has made them all. He is the one who we can trust because he has created all things. Because he is working all things together. And he is able to fulfill everything that he has promised. This chapter stands as a reminder to all of these truths. As well as the fact that it points us to Christ. Who was the servant who was born, suffered, died and was raised up. Indeed, we are continually reminded of God's faithfulness in all of these things, even as we wait, perhaps especially as we wait. There are many things in this life, there are many moments where we are tempted to wonder, has God forsaken? Has God forgotten? But remember, He does not forsake. He does not forget. For Christ has taken the judgment upon Himself so that His people will not be judged. He is to us a loving, glorious, heavenly Father. He's engraved your name upon the palms of his hands. He cannot forget. He will not forsake.